Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this year's convening of the Naval Postgraduate School's Naval Research Working Group. Our keynote speaker this afternoon is Marine Corps Lieutenant General Robert Walsh. We welcome General Walsh as the keynote, as well as a significant addition of our Secretary of the Navy guest lecture series. The lecture series is a cornerstone of the MPS experience, intended to add to the academic curriculum with presentations relevant to defense professionals, and more importantly, to enhance the critical thinking of students, staff, and faculty. It is especially fitting that we bring the lecture series together with the Naval Research Working Group today as we address future Naval research requirements, integrate MPS faculty and students into the total Naval R&D capability, and share knowledge gained from our research projects with stakeholders. I'd like to thank our Dean of Research, Dr. Jeff Padawan, his leadership team, Marine Colonel Todd Lyons, and Lieutenant Colonel Luke uh, Camardo, and Dr. Rod Abbott, and the great team that worked so hard to put this week's event together. And thank you to our research sponsors and potential sponsors who have traveled to be with us this week. Thank you all. Before we begin, two administrative remarks. General Walsh has agreed to allow us to record this event for future reference and internal credits. Also, for our students, a reminder that you can still participate in a survey to determine this year's recipient of the MPS Shifflin Award for Excellence in Teaching. Simply follow the links you have been provided via email Nominate five eligible professors you think deserve this recognition, and then select your top three choices from the list on the following page. Please submit your inputs by Friday. Now to introduce our keynote speaker. As the Commanding General of the Marine Corps Combat Development Command and the Deputy Commandant for Combat Development and Integration, Lieutenant General Walsh leads the innovative and efficient integration of marine warfighting capabilities across the operating forces and supporting establishment. He is a Naval Academy graduate from the class of 79 and a graduate of the Air Command and Staff College and the National War College. Although he has operationally flown both F-4 Phantoms and F&A 18 Hornets, he began his marine career as an infantry officer. A one-time First Marine Air Wing Aviator of the Year and Top Gun instructor, he commanded Marine Aviation units at every level, including Commanding General of the 2nd Marine Aircraft Wing deployed to Iraq. Significant flag officer assignments have included Director of Operations, United States Northern Command, and Director, Expeditionary Warfare Division for the Chief of Naval Operations, now OPNAV N95. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Lieutenant General Robert Walsh. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ron. Thanks for being here. Okay. Hey, everybody. How are we all doing out there today? Good. Well, first off, I'd like to thank Admiral Rout uh, for having me here today. Um, be able to talk to the students and faculty. I've been here for a couple days now, really digging, rolling up my sleeves, getting after what you all are doing here, and I can't tell you how impressed is always every time I get the opportunity to, to come out here to MPS uh, and spend time with those of you that are here that are thinking about and studying and writing about the phenomenon of war and the, the unique capability that we've got. It's just been a great couple days. I also would like to thank the, um, uh, also these topic sponsors and a, a, a potential topic sponsors for being here also. And, uh, and uh, your interest in this and trying to make our Navy and Marine Corps team so much better. Um, now this is a group that as I look out there and the group that I've been with today and look at all your resumes and bios, this is a fairly uh, intellectual group, a pretty intimidating group. Uh, so to be in front of you today when that invite came across my desk I very quickly signed it and sent it back going, okay, they probably made a mistake, but I'll come anyway because everybody likes to get out here and be around NPS and certainly see Monterey. 
Um, but it is. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. You're a very intimidating group, and certainly the faculty, because I know how, how good you are, all are, and I know how hard our selection rate, our selection process is for the Marine Corps uh, that comes here. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'll talk about a little bit, um, and, and first off, thank the faculty that's here. Um, because again, this is a fairly acclaimed university or, or Naval Postgraduate School, and the faculty that are here is very impressive. Uh, you just have to look at their resumes, they're kind of the hu who's who in the, uh, the academic world, and certainly uh, on what we've done in, in the Marine Corps and the Navy over the years, many of these faculty leaders have done so much to contribute to that. Um, and you're doing an awful lot to tackle some of the major challenges we've got across the Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, you're wrestling big problems, and that's exactly what we do at the Marine Corps Combat Development Command. We wrestle big problems, and that's what I'd like to try to do today, is try to tie you into uh, what we do and what we think, but uh, the other services are doing the same things that we do. So hopefully you can apply what I talk about, what we're doing in, in the Marine Corps, and apply it also across to uh, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and certainly the other services. Um, one of the things that we do and the Commandant tasks me to do is uh, to modernize the force. So our goal is, or our job at the Marine Corps Combat Development Command is to look at the future operating environment and decide where is the Marine Corps going to head in that future oper operating environment. Looking at what the new force needs, how the new force is going to fight, how it needs to train, the capabilities that it will need in the future uh, to complete its mission. Uh, this is not an easy task with the fiscal environment that we're in today. Uh, and I'll touch on that a bit later. But all of my peers that I've got and the other services that I work with all the time uh, are under the same uh, constraints that we've got now today with the budget that we're in and where the future operating environment is taking us. So there's a lot of challenges, but we look at it a lot of opportunities. Um, the future operating environment and the capabilities that it's demanding is what really brings me here today to try to connect with you uh, and talk to you and learn from what you're doing and try to connect you along with the topic sponsors of where we're looking to go in the future and hopefully give you some ideas on how you can connect into uh, a lot of our force development processes we've got. And the same thing holds true with events like the uh, Naval Research Work Working Group of matching those topics, those topic sponsors that they want to take ideas for, that they need that research, that we just don't have the time, expertise to put staff officers on uh, to be able to get anywhere near the product that you can provide with the academic capabilities you have here, the time to think, read, communicate, uh, and work with this great faculty you've got here that we could never do on our own, uh, and we certainly couldn't contract it out. So this is a, a rare opportunity to be able to get here and interface with you and understand what you're doing, and I look forward to doing that afterwards in the poster session that comes afterwards. I think the three things that I'd really like to talk to the, uh, the, the students, the faculty, and the topic sponsors today, I'd first look at how the operational env environment and our capability gaps can drive your graduate level um, research. Second, how to align your research with the most pressing capability gaps. And then third, the potential unseen applications and attributes of your research. Um, I had a very good session earlier today when I was down in the National Security Affairs Department with uh, Dr. Hafez and his team down there. We discussed a lot what's going on across the globe uh, in the operating environment that our, our Navy and Marine Corps is operating in today. Um, and I think looking at that operating environment, uh, we kind of break that down inside the Marine Corps operating concept with uh, complex terrain that we're going to have to navigate, uh, the opportunities and the dangers of technology proliferation, uh, information warfare and how that's increasingly used by our enemies, and that we're in a uh, situation where bat the battle of the signatures, as we call it, in understanding that those domains in, uh, in the signature management that we need to have, and also the domains in an uh, uh, increasing contested environment. And when I say that, you look at all the domains that we have today are in a contested environment. One of the other things that uh, our concept writers are working with the Army on, if we've got soldiers, and I see a bunch of soldiers in here today, is we're working with the uh, 
uh, with uh, Tradoc and writing the multi-domain battle concept. So another one, multi-domain, looking at all these domains and how we're going to operate in the future. But to kind of walk this through, what I would say is um, the 30,000 foot level uh, that we have up at the Pentagon or that we see up in Congress and the feedback we get up there. Uh, I'll just kind of walk through, you know, the different um, uh, framework we have of the four plus one. So walking you through, you know, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and violent extremist organizations. So to take a look at understanding what capability gaps we have and what capability needs we have, we have to really focus on that future operating environment. So I'll begin with on Russia. Um, as we look at Russia, Russia across the board has upgraded their uh, capabilities and also the operating places we see them operating today are places that we probably haven't seen them operate in since the Cold War. Uh, no longer are they viewed really as an embarrassed uh, rusted navy that is a mere shell of its former blue net water navy self. Uh, completely have changed and we can see that uh, in the operations. Uh, who would have thought that they would have been launching surface to surface missiles from the Caspian Sea into Syria? We wouldn't even have given that the thought just a few years ago and we see that uh, as that occurred. Um, long range bomber force that we can launch you know, from Nob Noster, Missouri, and launch that all the way into the Middle East. It's something that we do, and we take very pride in it. But if you looked at when they launched that bomber force that flew all the way down the Baltic, around the UK, down through uh, the Mediterranean, and launched strikes into Syria. They didn't have to do that. They could have launched that strike and flown straight across Russia, across Iran, into Syria. But they did that for a reason, to make a statement and to show that uh, the capabilities that they're bringing back and that they are back on the, uh, the world stage. Um, if you look at the operations that uh, they conducted in eastern Ukraine, um, in that area, and you take a look at, uh, we've taken a hard look at how they operated and the capabilities they used in that scenario, or that theater. Um, and we look at how our battalions or how our uh, special purpose MAGTAFs would have operated. Uh, what we saw was Ukrainian battalions there uh, quickly targeted and take severe casualties uh, after they turned on their radios, emitting on their radios uh, after then being geolocated by RF finding capabilities uh, and then using UASs to target them and then using top-down thermobaric munitions something that we have not seen at all in Iraq or Afghanistan, something that we're not prepared for. So if you look at those capabilities that we've seen there, it's just one laboratory of what they're doing in that area. Um, we quickly look at that this isn't the Taliban, this isn't ISIS, this isn't Al Qaeda in Iraq anymore. This is a far different threat environment and we're not sure that we're prepared for it. We've got a lot of work to do to make sure we are prepared. Um, Russia's intent is to undermine the, uh, the capability of NATO. Um, they view NATO as a threat to what they want to be and what they used to be. So there are clear indications there that that's what they want to do. Uh, they're developing areas to keep us out and cer certainly break down the capabilities of uh, NATO to operate freely. Um, they view our strengths as our alliances and our ability to project power globally. Uh, they also are working away at chipping away at the sovereignty of other nations uh, throughout the European continent. Um, they continue to advance their interests on the bo their borders, and we've seen their forces along their borders grow over time uh, with the intent to, again, to ensure that those, those nations that are part of NATO or are seeking to join NATO are paying attention. Uh, when you take a look at models, and many of you study models here, when you look at their model versus our model, um, they are working to challenge us asymmetrically. Our model is we're either at peace or we're at war. Their model uh, is different. They use a different model and they are operating constantly at what we call phase two because they really don't want to go to phase three with us because they know that they will lose if they go to phase three. But it's very interesting to watch their actions as they operate uh, in that hybrid gray zone area in phase two. And lastly, they are trying to influence every country in Europe to include their elections. 
shift gears and look at China and where China is today. Um, where's China really could be predicted to be out 10 years from now? And I think as we look out at the pace of modernization of the Chinese military, I think they will be our greatest threat if you project out 10 years from now. Uh, the same as Russia, they are determined to undermine our alliances and develop anti-access capabilities. They don't accept our current alliances and we don't accept them challenging our alliances. Uh, we don't have the economic hooks we need to maintain, though, the relationships that we really would like to truly have there to maintain those alliances. I'm sure we've probably got some Australian officers that are in the, the audience today, but if you look at Australia just as a case in point, probably 36% of the uh, economic trade of Australia's trade goes between China and Australia. So those economic hooks uh, that are needed to build alliances, uh, we're struggling in that area to try to build alliances where in the past we were much better off and in better shape than that. Um, Cambodia recently canceled a long-standing Navy program that provided humanitarian assistance, uh, possibly due to China's influence. Um, shifting gears to North Korea. I mean, is there anybody in here that would question that uh, Kim Jong-un is a dangerous and unpredictable leader when you start missing, mixing intercontinental ballistic missiles with nuclear capabilities? Our strengths there are certainly with Japan and South Korea. Uh, and if you look at that strength, that strength really is because of North Korea. When you get away from the peninsula and get into other parts of the Pacific, our alliances are not as strong because we don't see that specific threat that we do up in that area that the Japanese uh, or the South Koreans have. Uh, taking a look at Iran uh, and looking at Iran and the friction it is causing throughout the Middle East and what they are up to throughout the Middle East. Uh, and the Shia influence they're trying to spread throughout the Middle East. Uh, and if you look at the countries that are over there, our allies and partners that we deal with over there, we may be focused on violent extremist organizations. They're focused on the anti-Shia influence that Iran is spreading throughout the Middle East. And then finally, the violent extremism. Um, we just had a session with uh, uh, Chairman Dunford a couple of weeks ago, and as he looks at this, he views this as how sustainable is our efforts against violent extremism when we've got these other uh, threats that are in the four plus one construct. How much can we put into that construct towards VEOs? So as he looks at that, as he's looking at setting the globe and how much we put into our global, global force management process and where the forces, the Navy and Marine Corps forces deploy across the globe along with the other services, that's a lot into his equation of how much do we put towards each of the threats, how much can we really sustain uh, in support of uh, violent extremist organizations and, and uh, taking them down. Um, last year I mentioned that the Commandant of the Marine Corps asked us to take a look at um, developing a Marine Corps operating concept that we had not developed in quite a while since really before 9-11. Uh, after 15 years of being heavily involved in ground campaigns, uh, we looked at the threats, the operating environments, things like the rebalance to the Pacific, uh, what the Marine Corps' Title X responsibilities are, what we are as part of the Naval, Navy Marine Corps team. Uh, we reviewed that, we looked at the future operating environment, um, and as we studied that and we came up with our, our Marine Corps operating concept, we really broke down that future operating environment into five separate areas. Again, this complex terrain that we see Marines operating in the future, uh, navigating through the human domain, but also the geophysical domain that's going to be probably dominated by more operations by um, sailors and Marines operating in the littorals and mega cities. A big problem we see right now is those populations are moving to the littorals, near coastlines, in large cities, and how are we going to operate in that uh, future operating environment. The technology proliferation that we see and the ability of adversaries to hold our forces at risk at increasing distances, that along with that technology proliferation and the speed of technology proliferation that you and many of you study this no more than anybody and how quickly technology is moving and you equate that to the, uh, the Byzantine acquisition process that we've got within DOD. 
and we see it as forced developers of not being able to move fast enough where the adversaries in a lot of cases can move faster than we can. Next we look at information warfare and how our adversaries are putting a lot of uh, time and effort, capabilities and money into information warfare as the center of their operations. Again, all you have to look at is Russia as a master of operating in this area. And next, some of the things that we haven't seen since the Cold War is this battle of signatures. And emitting is to be detected, and to be detected is to be targeted, and to be targeted is to be killed. And we look at electronic warfare is going to become our new knight. Just as in the past when the knight became an area that we could own and dominate against the threat, Electronic warfare is an area that we're going to have to move into, and we're going to have to own that area in the whole electronic magnetic spectrum. And finally, contested domains are becoming the new normal. And, and having to operate in there uh, in contested domains. As we look at uh, air superiority, uh, we look across the globe, and there's going to be a lot of places we have that we don't have air superiority or won't have it. Uh, and that superiority in any domain, whether it be cyber, and how do we maintain superiority in pockets where we need to operate uh, and maintain that for the set period of time that we need. Um, but we've got to be able to pre uh, be prepared to prevail in these type of condi conditions. Um, so what you may not know is I view and we view you as a key part of solving our problems, probably more so than you think you are today. Um, particularly when it comes to problem solving and taking a look at the problems that we have. And one of the problems that we see that we've struggled with after uh, the last 15 years of constant conflict is deferred modernization and our readiness. And you see all the services looking at deferred modernization and where we put our investments. And we talk about a bow wave that we've got in deferred modernization. Um, we've risked that modernization to maintain our readiness. Things like in the Navy with the optimized fleet response plan of dialing back how forward deployed the Navy's going to be to be able to afford the maintenance time in the ships that it needs after many, many years of over deployments to be able to reset the Navy in the right way and maintain that balance. The same thing we're doing on the Marine Corps side. We're reducing and looking at where we can reduce our deployment to dwell because not only are Marines tired and Marines families tired, but we also need to create the white space that we need back home to train against peer adversaries that we've not had to deal with in many, many years. You could be home for less time if all you're doing is training against counterinsurgency. When you've got to deal against a higher end threat like we're dealing with today, then you've got to have more time to be able to be home and train to those threats. So that's something the Commandant's actively involved with is dialing back the amount of deployments we've got so we can stay actively training to the, uh, the threats. And I don't think there's probably any doubt in anybody's minds that probably in the last 25 years that I can think of, this is probably the most dynamic change when it comes to the future operating environment and figuring out where our sailors and Marines may be operating in the future and ensuring that they've got the right capabilities in their hands when they deploy forward. Um, one of the things the Commandant wrote was he wants to see a fifth generation Marine Corps. And inside the Marine Corps, you know, if you look at fifth generation, most everybody in the Marine Corps would attribute fifth generation to the uh, F-35 um, B and C Lightning II aircraft that we're bringing online. Um, but we look at this and the Commandant looks at it as he wants the rest of the Marine Corps to be able to have the same capabilities that the F-35 has. So when you're a pilot in an F-18 uh, today, when you can look and designate targets visually and pass them over links to other aircraft that are a long ways away from you and be able to target like that, that's fourth generation capability. The sensor fusion that's involved in the F-18 or the F-35 is a sensor processor capability there is fifth generation. As Marines, we look at that capability, not the stealth, not the precision. It's really its sensing capability and processing capability that really is what's making that aircraft fifth generation. And so as we look at that, we look across the Marine Corps. We've got that in the F-35, or we're getting it in the F-35. Our first squadron is already deployed to Japan, uh, and it will be aboard USS Wasp this summer. 
uh, on its first deployment, and it's, the squadron is currently operating in South Korea today. So they were there about a month, and we deployed them right into South Korea, if you don't think that's a signal on sending fifth generation capability forward, uh, is what we did. But across the MAGTAF, the Marine Air Ground Task Force, how do we get those capabilities? Things are getting smaller today, more miniaturized, that when you can fuse, I can fuse on my F-35 visor sensor information uh, that's automated, that I don't have to think, I can deselect, and it's all there and it's fused. Why can't our infantrymen have the same capability on the ground? Uh, and the capabilities are getting smaller, more miniaturized. Some of the things I talked about today with some of you on mesh networking, the capabilities and sharing that information, working in distributed operations, just as the Navy's operating distributed lethality and distributed maritime operations, the same thing holds true on the ground. And so we're working a lot in that area to work through that thing. But as I talk about developing capabilities like that, uh, shift gears um, to the current fiscal environment and kind of talk about that for a second. Um, I would say you would probably all agree that the congressional budget process that we're in right now today is broke. Um, for some of you that are studying uh, finance and some of the business degrees or getting your MBAs, uh, as you look at congressional rev uh, um, resolutions and operating under a CR, if you look at it, we've been operating under CR for 30% of the last five years. Study any corporation that you study out there today and let them only be able to invest and do new starts in three out of four quarters and see how well they would do uh, in competing against their adversaries or their other business competitors. That's the situation that we've been under and, and uh, continuously you look at this CR right now, more than halfway through the year, still haven't gotten a budget, haven't gotten to get our new starts going, haven't been able to invest where we needed to invest in, and then hopefully somewhere in the next few months they're going to dump a year's worth of money on us, we're not going to be able to execute it, and you just can't plan in that type of environment. So part of our deferred modernization, the frustration from us is, yes, we've been engaged in a fairly uh, consistent war effort that we've been focused on, but now also Congress isn't helping us out at all to get out of this hole. So that's a, a, a big push, and I think you will see the congressional testimony last week from the, uh, the service chiefs was a little bit more aggressive back towards Congress on, hey, you need to fix this and do something about it, because we're not going to be able to operate in this environment and be able to win on tomorrow's battlefield. Um, when we talk about key leaders within the Defense Department, I, I would say this top line, we, will, we probably will not see a top line increase in 19. In fact, the POM, the budget I'm putting together right now today, has no increase in top line, and we don't expect an increase in top line. Uh, in fact, I would say probably for the next five to 10 years, we won't expect, we're not planning, the Marine Corps is not planning for a top line increase. We're planning on dealing with what we've got, with inflation factor flown in, in. But we're not expecting that we're going to see a lot of growth that we initially were hearing from the administration when they first came in. Um, our force, we just went through a Marine Corps force uh, um, review. Um, we had looked at, we've got 182,000 Marines. Congress grew us to 185 without the money. Uh, and we looked at, we probably needed about 194,000 Marines to do the minimum we needed to do. 194,000. We've re-looked that, we've drawn the line and said we're not going to go past 185 unless we see money that comes with it. Because we're just, we, we are, it's too critical at this point to modernize the force. So wrestling with these challenges, you know, you look at that balance versus readiness versus modernization. And where do we head? And you look at it, how do we define readiness? And how do we define modernization? And where do they touch each other? And where's that, that seam between them? Um, and at what point does current readiness begin to assume the risk from deferred modernization, that you're putting too much money into being a four-deployed Navy Marine Corps team, can do for the nation, that now we're deferring that, moder that readiness? Um, again, if I looked at uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict and used that as a 21st century warfighting laboratory, again, would we have, how would we have done there, and would we have not done as well because of readiness, current readiness, and being deficient in that area, or would it be from deferred modernization? So getting that balance right is really critical to the future, ensuring that, uh, that the cost is too high to get that wrong. We just can't buy our way out of this stuff. 
So if you look at General Dunford had a good example of that when he talked about ISR, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance, our UAS capability. And what he looked at and said, and we can't buy our way out, um, we've grown our UAS capability 1,200% since 2001. Just since 2008, we've grown it 600%. And we are currently only meeting 35% of the demand. So that's one example of um, looking at this, that we've got to look at things in different ways. And many of you can help us in that area and looking through a different lens and how we should be able to, to view this. Um, some of the best innovation the Navy and Marine Corps did was when we were operating on austere budgets. Uh, we talk a lot about those inner war years between World War I and World War II, when we did a lot of experimentation, a lot of innovation, without a lot of money. And we learned an awful lot, certainly from the Marine Corps, Navy and Marine Corps, many of the amphibious capabilities that those sailors and Marines were developing in a very austere budget environment were developed in those innovative years, and it were the success that we had, both in the Pacific uh, and in the Atlantic, also in Europe, that we developed in those interwar years. So we can do a lot during a period of austerity. And I'm not saying we're in a period of austerity. I just don't think it's going to be anywhere near as rosy with the growth that we initially had thought it might be. But innovative people like you, we believe, are really our advantage. Our advantage to think through this. This is how we're going to get through these things. It's going to think through these things and put our investments in the right places. Um, one of the things that there's been a lot of good focus on is accelerating acquisitions. So when I say we've got a Byzantine acquisition system, a Byzantine requirement system, those requirements in a lot of ways have been developed around building large platforms and capabilities. A Ford class carrier, an F-35. In those kind of cases, you need the discipline that you need to take the time to test things, develop things, do the right research and development to ensure you get it right on the back end. But the way technology is moving so quickly today, we cannot afford to treat everything the same way. And that's what we tend to try to do, to treat everything through the same process. So there's been a lot of effort to kind of work quickly, and I think that's an area that your research um, can help us in that and how we can find ways to move faster. And I think a lot of this, you will find the academic uh, value in moving forward in this. In the Marine Corps, um, in our uh, future force design methodology, one of the things we have is what we call our campaign of learning. Inside that campaign of learning, we've got 12 war fighting challenges. We use that war fighting challenges um, as a lens to be able to provide a framework uh, to be able to develop the capabilities we need for the future. I'll circle back to that in just a couple minutes, but right now I would say that's a starting point for understanding where the Marine Corps puts its investments by looking through that, the analytical rigor that we need there and in the, uh, the POM or Program Objective Memorandum or budget process. Um, one of the things that's helped us move faster within the Marine Corps is we had some visionary leaders that were back in the mid-1990s that developed the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab. The Marine Corps Warfighting Lab is a lab laboratory where we do our future thinking, our experiments, our war games, uh, our science and technology. The commanding general that uh, works down there for me is also vice ONR, so that's a very key piece of it. And just recently, we put our rapid capabilities office inside that warfighting lab. That warfighting lab connects the operators. And that's one of the things we see is critical, that there's a lot of people, whether it's industry, academia, um, our warf naval warfare centers, but connecting them with the operators is the key part, and our warfighting lab is a key part of that. We also stood up an experimentation force. Coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan, we saw the really the need to move faster in experimentation. So we've taken a, a battalion of Marines, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, and they have been our experimentation force for the last uh, really over a year. The unique part about what we're doing with them, though, is we're going to deploy them as a deployable unit. So we've given them lots of robotics, lots of automation, lots of C2, lots of uh, EW capabilities that normal units wouldn't have. We've also reconfigured how each company within the battalion looks, the different weapons they have, and we're analyzing what works best, and when we bring it back, we'll hopefully be able to make some decisions. Um, the Commandant also opened up a warfighting, or excuse me, an innovation portal uh, for crowdsourcing ideas throughout the, uh, the operating forces. 
very successful. We've had two of these targeted quarterly um, innovation events, uh, and I think one of the, uh, the winners of the, uh, one of our warfighting challenges came right here from NPS, that we're going to take the program, develop it, move it forward into a program of record. So that's a capability. We, every year we have the Commandant's Innovation Symposium to bring new ideas. And like I said, I, I talked about our Rapid Capabilities Office. All the services are developed some type of Rapid Capabilities Office to try to move things faster. We put it inside our warfighting war lab so we can rapidly prototype and rapidly field things for, faster. Now one of the key things that we've been up, on, up in the hill with Congress arguing for is we need the law to allow us to fund projects to be able to rapidly experiment, demonstrate capabilities, and then if we decide that we want to bring them in, we can bring them in well outside the normal requirements process. So in the National Defense Authorization Act in 16 and in 17, Congress put language in there to allow us to do exactly that. Now the struggle we're working through is to ensure that the right funding to the right projects can get into our, uh, our budgets and stay there uh, once it gets over to the Hill to allow us to do that. Um, the Department of the Navy also wrote an accelerated acquisition for, for rapid development, demonstration, and fielding directive. That's been very helpful within the Department of the Navy to really get the right process in place to allow us to also go faster. Um, we also stood up within the Department of the Navy the Maritime Accelerated Capabilities Office the rapid prototyping, experimentation, and demonstration process within that. And again, we stood up our Marine Corps Requirements Office. Our biggest uh, probably roadblock what we will have to all of this, though, is regulations, policies, and lawyers. So working through that is still a long way to go, but we've got, we think, the, uh, the initiative that's moving forward in this. So the key takeaway, I think, for all of that piece is aligning researches, researchers, technologists, combat developers, acquisition professionals, and operators with a sense of urgency to look at the gaps and move forward with where we're going. Shifting gears, I'd like to now just kind of talk about um, getting uh, uh, into an area that you're interested in, is how do you help us solve those capability gaps? And what can you do here at the Naval Postgraduate School to get us in this area? And I feel like if we don't connect well with you, and we don't get the right uh, projects moving and the right studies, that this engine of change that we talk about is going to run over the top of us. And you can certainly see that in, in industry today and how quickly things are changing and how rapidly industry works. Um, a couple processes I would say. The capabilities-based analysis. Every service, when we develop our budget, our program and object objective memorandum, um, which goes into the budget process, Everybody does a capabilities-based analysis beforehand to look at what those capability gaps are, are based on the future operating environment and where we're going to put that investment. So one of the key places I would say is look at those CBAs. Where are the services seeing where their gaps are and where do you need to work inside that process? Those CBAs will develop gap lists and solutions lists. That's what we work off of at, at Quantico. We've got our gap lists and solutions lists that come from our capabilities-based assessments. Uh, so researching in that area is a key place. Another one is looking at where the services put their money. Take a look at the palm, follow the money. That's going to be a place to look at inside the services where those priorities are. There's a lot of things that I've got that I can't fund for the Commandant. But that I'm prioritizing and figuring out what are the most important things. So if you look at where the money is, certainly in functional areas, and I'll give you one for example. Information warfare within the Marine Corps is the number one priority. So if you look at our palm that we just built for 17, 18, and now 19, we are putting lots of manpower, structure, equipment, training into information warfare. That's a priority. So when I brought that to the Commandant last week to show him what we were doing in 19, the first thing he looked at was, I want to see IW right at the top of that. So that would be an area for you to look at where the services are actually putting their money to be able to understand what their priorities are. Left of that, if you're looking out deeper than the palms, which are just five-year looks, now obviously you've got research and development that will impact later than that. Um, 
on the Marine Corps side, and I would say with the same thing with the Army, is looking at our warfighting challenges. Those warfighting challenges, those things I talked about, they're first order problems, the 12 that we've got. For example, one of them is developing battle space understanding. That's one. How do we bring that together? Um, and, and how do we understand the battle space? But those things are key ones that we use our warfighting challenges that are inputs in trying to solve those problems from across the operating forces and inputs and from, uh, of, from also research, development, academia, uh, and so, so forth. The next one I would say is look at their science and technology investments. Every service puts out an S&T investment plan or strat strategic plan. Look at where they're putting on their strategic plan and we're putting their, where they're putting their money. That's a key piece. Um, and then I think in the S&T effort, look at what they're actually experimenting with. Uh, one of the key things that we've looked at when you start talking uh, anti-access and how are we going to operate in a future operating environment, one of the key problems we've looked at is how is the Navy Marine Corps going to conduct amphibious operations in the, in the future? There's a lot of naysayers out there that say we're not going to be able to do that in the future. There were a lot of naysayers back in the 20s and 30s that said the same thing. Um, and we've moved forward with a lot of things like vertical envelopment, uh, using helicopters, V-22s, outside of just surface craft. Um, but one of the things that we're doing in this S&T area is we've teamed with uh, uh, Secretary Stackley and his team up there on the new advanced naval technology exercises. They're part of this rapid prototyping effort. And at the end of the, uh, April, we've got, uh, it's a long name, it's a ship to shore maneuver, exploration, and experimentation. But how do Marines get ashore differently in the future? Uh, it's not all about taking amphibious vehicles straight from the ship to shore. You look at the technology that's out there today, whether it's um, artificial intelligence, robotics, sensors, air, surface, subsurface, it's all out there. And what we did was we brought together um, 15 or 15 warfare centers. We brought together industry. Uh, we brought together research labs and said, help us with our operators solve this problem. We've been working this for about six months, and at the end of April, we're going to do our first, the Navy and Marine Corps is going to do the first one, and this is going to be the first one that we're going to do down at Camp Pendleton. And we've got 53 different uh, dynamic systems and 52 static systems uh, operating in all, all domains. Uh, including electronic magnetic spectrum. 32 different organizations participating in this, and we're looking at advanced unmanned systems, autonomy, sensors, communications, C2 systems, and uh, to support us in, in emerging amphibious concepts. Um, and so that's a piece of what we've got going out in front, and that's an area that I think uh, many of, much of your research can help us in, just as an example of that, and you could see that across all the other services. Um, so I think pulling that together, looking at uh, after action reports, um, if you're not able to get to these type of things, look at the research of what the reports are that we put out or other services put out from their experiments, their exercises, post-deployment, what we're learning from that, it's how we learn an awful lot ourselves. Um, what goes on in a, uh, a deployment and what we, equipment we send out there, a lot of new capabilities, prototype capabilities, we push out, see how it works, we write reports that come back when it's all over. Um, so I would say that, that that's a, a piece of it. When it comes to experimentation, next week I'm going to be talking to our commanders course. And this is a key part of research is has, you have to have the experimentation. Change is hard. We find change is very difficult. When we stood up our experimentation force and started moving new ideas and new capabilities into an operational unit, there were people at the very top that were all for it. And then when you got down to the NCOs and the company grade officers at the lowest level, they were all for it. Everywhere in between, a lot of friction, don't go too fast, they can't handle this technology, and we continuously see just the opposite with this, uh, this new generation. Uh, and so I think the key part of all of what I've kind of talked about, this gap analysis and how you can tie to it, the advantage really of the Naval Postgraduate School, unlike other um, great uh, academic institution, is you are tied inextricably linked to the customer. The Navy and the Marine Corps as your customer, in, in most cases, is the ones you're tied to. That research work you're doing, we're hungry for what you're developing, the things that you're developing, and why it's so important for, for you to stay linked and tied to this. 
Um, the last area that I'll finish with really is just kind of talking to you about um, what is the, the other unseen uh, advantages of coming here to the Naval Postgraduate School and why this can benefit not only the services but also can in, uh, benefit yourselves personally. Um, last fall I was here at NPS and the Marine Corps does not have a uh, technical PhD program. Um, the Commandant had just decided to stand up a strategic um, PhD program that we've just selected two pilot candidates for. But we had not had anything along the lines of some of the other services have from a technical PhD program. I was at a social af afterwards and uh, Captain Ezra Aiken, uh, one of the Marines that's here, uh, came up to me afterwards in the social and said, you know, if I stayed a little bit longer, I could get my PhD. Um, and I looked at that and talked to him about how's his career, what's his path, what has he done, is this going to fit? Um, and with that, the light bulb was coming on as I look at what goes on here and the, the uh, PhDs that are developed for other services. I said, you know what, I got to get back with the Commandant and talk to him about this. The Commandant had also been president of Marine Corps University when he was a Major General, so he's very positive on uh, education. Um, Within about two weeks, we hooked Ezra up with the Commandant. They VTC'd back and forth, and it was done deal. Commandant said, Ezra, you're going to be the first one. We're going to keep you there, and we're going to get you to be the first pilot in our PhD program. Um, so that's an example of that. That also led to another opportunity we had uh, with one of the main areas that we're really struggling with is live virtual constructive training environment really the synthetic training environment that we really see in a lot of ways is the future and a lot of things we're doing. If you take a look at across industry, uh, police departments, fire departments, our aviation community is well ahead of us uh, than we are on the ground side, but how do you move this forward? Um, ran into Lieutenant Colonel Byron Harder while I was here. Uh, Byron has a master's degree in computer science that he had previously gotten, and he'd gotten our 8846 MOS data system specialist. He was selected to come back here, and while he was back here, he was getting his second master's in modeling virtual uh, environments and simulation in the MOVES program. Uh, he was getting his 8825 MOS for modeling and simulation officer. Um, same thing held true. If we just kept Byron here just a little bit longer, uh, Byron would be able to compete and get his, uh, his PhD um, in simulation. And, and I will tell you, what, what, what linked with me was getting together with the academic departments and going with the faculty of what does a PhD do? How can it help the Marine Corps? And looking at that and how it can help us pull research, industry together at a higher level that our average staff officers don't understand uh, again, it clicked with me. We went back. We talked to the Commandant. Uh, Byron is completing his degree here, and if I, if I know right, George, he's on his way PCSing. He's uh, going to be checking in at the Training and Education Command, which works underneath to me, and he is going to run simulation for the Marine Corps and pull this all together. Um, so that's an example of somebody here that's done the study. We trust in the academic work that's done here. We don't have that capability back inside the Marine Corps, and Byron's going to be the one that's going to pull this forward for us, uh, along with a lot of other smart people that are down in Orlando, Florida, in industry, but he's the one that's going to really be able to do this for us. So I think those are two vignettes on uh, how um, this leads to the importance of what we do. Um, the other piece is, is being able to develop unassailable requirements, to be able to look at a problem that you're developing now a skill that other officers don't have. To be able to look at a problem, look at it a different way, analyze it, figure out where the best way to go is. Um, and those unassailable requirements are critical. When I was at OpNav N95, we were coming up with a new ship, the LXR, which was going to be a replacement for our LSDs. We weren't sure exactly where we wanted to go with that. But the Naval Postgraduate School, through the research that was done here, uh, gave us a, a lot of detailed analysis on survivability and sustainment costs, which allowed the Secretary of the Navy, 
the Commandant of the Marine Corps and the CNO make a decision to use the LPD hull form or a derivative of that LPD-17 class is the next LXR. But a lot of the work that was done right here inside NPS allowed us to do that. Uh, and, and work there. So again, working through that uh, decision making, I'll, and I'll just kind of say, um, as we look at what the CNO does, uh, with the CNO with this high velocity learning, and trying to take organizations across the Navy to different levels, that again is some of the things, whether you know it or not, that's what you're learning here. And that ability to go back into an organization, view the problem differently, and be able to accelerate and take that organization in an innovative way to new levels is something your average fleet officer is not going to have the same capabilities that you have that you're learning here. And we know we're hungry to get you back into the, the operating forces to be able to do that. But the, the CNO is certainly focused on that and moving that, uh, that team forward. Um, and so I guess I'd kind of finish here by saying that uh, the value of the Naval Postgraduate School is on a very high-pieced price of property here in California. But that's not the value of this institution. The hundredth power of that formula will take you to those people that are here in this room today. The students, the faculty, that really make this organization what it is and what you do for the Navy and Marine Corps team. Um, so I think like I felt like I've spent a very valuable couple days here, but I'm confident that you're going to be able to take this uh, to new levels, uh, both innovatively within the academic world, with industry, and with the, uh, the operating forces, and with your service when you go back there. Um, so again, I thank you for your time, your prof professionalism, your dedication, your interest in making our military better. Uh, and I look forward to meeting you at the poster session afterwards and spending some time with you. And with that, uh, I'll open it up for any questions or comments you may have. Thank you.